Well hello, welcome to another episode of Jim's Lover Garden. Unfortunately we've been rained off today so uh, there's not going to be a lot going on at the allotment. There's going to be a few more bits of tidying up in the greenhouse perhaps but uh, I'm most certainly not going to be digging in this weather. But today's episode is all about um, making your own Margaret Hazel fungi and um, also a bit more on the, um, the seeds and stuff that I've been putting in over the past uh, couple of days. So welcome to another episode of Jim's Lover Garden. Okay, so Mother Nature Part 14. Now, um, as you know, I've been doing a series of uh, Mother Nature videos. And uh, on um, Mother Nature Part 7 was talking about all sorts of um, benefits from using mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, for, you know, you know, for, uh, for um, basically, it, it colonates the plants and then it brings nutrients and, um, and water to the plants. And it's like a, a symbiotic relationship between the fungi and the plants, and basically your plant gets bigger, stronger, and everything like that. So, uh, microhizal fungi is, is is a really good thing to be using within um, your garden. Now, I, you know, as I said, I put an episode out before explaining all the um, the sort of biology behind it and all the rest of it. So, I'll put a link across the bottom of the screen now, which will take you to that. But um, if you if you want to get to the end of this video, then watch that. It's the it's episode three in February. Um, and it, it, in the title it's got microhizal fungi but anyway there's a link across the bottom now to, uh, to, to take that if you, if you want to understand what microhizal fungi is. So following on what I explained um, in, 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 in the last part of this was um, you know you can actually make your own microhizal fungi now it's quite expensive to buy in the shops it's about uh, in, in a bag well, it's, it's not so expensive but in a bag sort of that much uh, which is probably uh, I think about 250 grams or maybe 400 grams, it's, a, it, it's about five or six pound in the UK and uh, basically that's in like granular form and it'll last for 12 months so you know you, you know you can get one bag and then just use it as and when you're um, doing it so but I'm going to be using this on a, on a variety of vegetables um, this year and it does inc it, it increase your yields quite a lot so it's you know it's well worth doing but what I want to do now is explain to you how you can actually make your own um, inoculum which is basically ground which is uh, or soil which has got um, which has got microhizal fungi in it, and uh, there's there's there's, there's a quite a few different um, um, sort of sorts of microhizal fungi. So basically, this is this is soil which has already got it in there alive. So you can um, so you can uh, you know put your plants in it, and basically it costs you nothing. So about eighty percent of plants are actually um, um, find a beneficial relationship with microhizal fungi, and it's most of most of um, the vegetables that you get in your garden, there are certain things that don't, um, that, that, that sort of don't benefit from it. Um, but uh, obviously, I, I explained that in the last episode, so I shan't go into the, um, too much detail there. So basically, to make your own um, inoculum is uh, quite easy. It takes about three months to do it, and uh, basically, what you do is you need to find um, like a hedgerow or uh, underneath a tree or um, a, um, a grassland that's not been cultivated or some woods or something like that uh, where, the, where the ground's not been cultivated for some time and you've got uh, really um, sort of mature um, plants there. Um, so hedgerows are typically quite, uh, quite useful. Um, underneath trees, um, things like oak trees and that don't, don't have microhizal so don't go for oak trees. Um, but basically what you want to do is collect some of the soil that's that, that's round the bottom of the plant, and it needs to be obviously soil that's not been rotivated, uh, well you know, or sort of cultivated. And what you need to be doing is collecting, go down about nine inches, take off the top layer, and go down about nine inches, and collect some of the soil there. And if I was you, I'd probably, um, I'd, I'd probably collect well as much as you can carry, basically. But I would say, um, you know, sort of collect about sort of twenty kilos of soil, which is probably, um, I don't know, perhaps a two foot square going down by about nine inches so 
60 centimeters by 60 centimeters by sort of 25 centimeters and dig all that ground out if you've got roots in there leave them in there don't take the roots out and then sort of you know put all them in a bag and um, bring them to an area where you uh, where you're going to want to um, you know sort of keep it for the next three months now it needs to be in an area which is obviously free from um, animals that are going to eat the plants and all the rest of it so you know you need it in a nice um, sort of secure area somewhere where you can water it and um, and all the rest of it and basically you've got you've got now two methods what you need to do now is is is, is get the mycorrhizal fungi which is in that soil to multiply and the way to do this is uh, basically what you need to do is plant two methods either either, either get a um, a um, series of buckets or a, or a, a large tray which is kind of the same kind of size of the soil that you've taken out you don't need it any sort of deeper than sort of nine inches um, or dig a trench in the ground and line it with plastic put your fork through the plastic so the water can drain through but uh, and then put your um, soil that you've collected into the into the um, into the ground an ideal way of collecting the soil um, is to uh, look for mole hills which are near a, an old hedgerow so there's, there's quite a few hedgerows by me and uh, if you if sort of hawthorn hedgerows which you know haven't moved um, and if there's mole hills by the hedgerow, get the mole hill because that's going to have the mycorrhizal fungi in it. Um, what I'm not suggesting to people is to go out to woods and stuff and start digging holes everywhere. What I would suggest is if you dig a hole, you need to put back into that hole and, and put it back exactly as you found it. And obviously, if it's private property, always ask permission and don't damage anything whilst you're doing it. You can collect this quite easily without making any damage or anything like that. And if you've got a hedgerow or a tree in your garden, Obviously, take it from your own garden because that's the you know you know you know it's going to be the best thing to do. So, as soon as you put the soil into your um, into your trench or your or, or your pot, what you then need to do is start to plant some plants into it. Now, the plants that you're going to put in there we call them bait plants, and the the whole reason for growing these plants is to is to make the hydro is basically to feed the hydro um, hydro uh, mycorrhizal fungi. So, the um, as you know, the the mycorrhizal fungi will will grow if there's a plant there. You know, you've got the symbiotic relationship between the two. So you have to have plants to make the mycorrhizal fungi grow. So what you need to do is is plant, ideally a combination of plants within either the buckets or your your um, trench where you've put your um, your soil. What I would suggest you grow are um, leeks and onions, uh, leeks or onions in there, and also peas and beans. Now. Into um, plant them. So basically, just get yourself some some um, some leek um, sets or some onion sets, and uh, or even just seeds, and sort of intersperse them round within your, your your buckets or your trench, and then also get some beans or peas and put them in there. You're not going to eat these crops. These are just bait crops, which which you're going to send the roots down, which you're going to feed the um, the mycorrhizal fungi within the ground. Then you need to leave that for about three months until these plants have established themselves. Obviously, keep them well watered, and uh, what will happen is the uh, the mycorrhizal fungi will then feed off the plants that you put in there, the bait plants. You need to have a combination. Really, I would I would suggest you put some onions and some uh, beans in there. To be honest with you, that's you know that's the way I'd do it. Um, now, as soon as as soon as you've um, as soon as these plants have grown over kind of three months, your um, your 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 trap, which is basically your um, are, are, are your, your pots or your, your trench that you put your soil in, will then be full of mycorrhizal um, fungi feeding off your onions and your uh, and your beans. Now, what you need to do now is to trick the mycorrhizal fungi into thinking that the beans and the uh, the peas have uh, been removed. So, what you need to do is cut all of them off at the ground. So, your beans, leaving the roots in the ground, don't disturb the ground. Cut all the beans off at the surface of the ground. Take all your onions, you know, pull all your onions out. Um, so then, all you've left then is bare earth, and the roots are going into the ground. Now, what this will do is it will trick the mycorrhizal fungi into start to produce reproductive um, um, spores, and basically these will it, it, it'll then go into a moat for about sort of two or three weeks. The mycorrhizal fungi, which is in the ground, will start to go right. Okay, I need to start making reproductive spores, and it'll it'll fill the soil with spores. As soon as as soon as um, sort of two or three weeks have gone by after you're cutting all the crops out, 
that ground is then going to be full of um, um, inoculum, basically, which is the which is the mycorrhizal fungi spores within the ground. Now, to use it, basically, all you need to do is um, obviously cut down the cut down the uh, the plants um, as um, you know, sort of two two weeks or so before you need to use it, and the, and the you know the inoculum will be at its best after about two or three weeks. As time goes on, obviously it's it's going to be become less um, full of the um, you know the mycorrhizal um, fungi spores, but um, the uh, all you need to do then is when you're planting up a plant, basically put some put some compost in the bottom of your pot, for example, and then put a put a, a layer, a couple of couple of inches of of, um, of your uh, inoculum from your you know your mycorrhizal fungi with dirt in there. Make sure your plant roots are touching that and then put some more compost around the top and then the mycorrhizal fungi is in there. If you're planting trees for example <coughs> when you put your tree in just just put a, a couple of spadefuls of this under the uh, the plant so it's in contact with the roots of the tree and then just just fill back up with dirt as, you know as long as you've got that in there then the mycorrhizal fungi spores will be in connection with the roots the, the tree will become colonated with the with the fungi and it'll be away again. So this is a free and easy ish way of um, of uh, making microhazel fungi for yourself. Um, it, it does take a little bit of planning, you know, and, you, and, and it does take a, um, a few months. But if you're planning to plant in a row of um, I don't know a hedgerow or trees or, or whatever, then thinking ahead, which is which is one of the arts to gardening, always think ahead of what you're about to do. Um, you know, you can you can go out. You can collect some um, dirt from underneath the hedgerow or whatever. Uh, bring it back, put it into a bucket in your greenhouse or wherever. Put some of your bait plants in there. Always have a couple in there because what because there are different types of uh, microhazel fungi. And obviously, what you want to do is make sure that you're um, basically multiplying all of them that are in there. And what you need to do is have, have most certainly onions or leeks or beans and peas in there, and then that'll give you the combination to you know you know for it all to grow. And then, um, you know, and then as soon as it's ready, obviously, then you know, a couple of weeks before you're going to be starting your plants or, or whatever, and you need to be, um, you know, putting it in the ground. That's when you cut it all down, two weeks before you need it, and then it'll be ready then to, you know, break up all of the roots that are in, all of the roots that are in the um, inoculum, which are from your onions and your beans. Don't, whatever you do, pull them out because that's where all of the um, the spores are going to be. So basically, what I would do if I was you is uh, just get, you know get your spade in there and sort of dig it all up. But all the, all the little bits of roots, break them all up because that's where all the microhazel fungi is. You want them to go into your new plants because you, you know. So any roots from your beans or your onions, leave them in the ground, and when you and when you start to use it, chop them all up into little pieces. You, you know, you know as best you can. And uh, because that's where all the spores are going to be to um, you know to colonate your new plants. So that's how you can make your own microhazel fungi. Okay, so one other thing that we can start putting in at this time of year um, are the um, tomatoes, and these are money maker. I always grow money maker in the greenhouse. Um, I do grow other varieties of tomato. Um, I also grow the little cherry ones as well, uh, which I've basically save my seed. Now this is this is the first time in about five or six years that I've actually not used my own seed to do the um, to do the um, money maker. What I normally do is keep the tomato, um, some of the seeds out of the tomato, and then just dry um, dry the seeds out on a, um, a little bit of kitchen tissue and then they're perfectly good for the next year. But because I managed to pick these seeds up for 20p I thought oh, blow it, I'll, uh, I'll have a fresh, fresh batch this year. So just so you can see I'll see most people think have probably seen um, what, what tomato seeds look like, but when they come out of the packet, they look something like that. Um, obviously, they've been dried out, you know, for the packaging. But what I'm going to be doing in each one of these cells, I'm just going to be putting two um, tomato seeds, and I'm going to try and get them around um, half an inch apart. Now, I grow something like 30 tomato plants in the greenhouse, um, if not more. Uh, hang on, let me think. So, uh, no, actually more about about um, about forty tomato plants or so in the greenhouse. And really, tomatoes are really quite a um, a sort of cash crop, uh, which is one point I was going to make about the herbs. I mean, if you've seen 
um, if you've seen how expensive herbs are in a in a in a shop to grow, uh, sorry to buy, um, you'll um, I just noticed the uh, compost is a little bit hard in there. Um, you know, just a little sort of few bunches of herbs um, in a standard supermarket will set you back, you know, um, a pound or so, where you can you can grow your herbs in your allotment and have a, a constant supply. Even if you haven't got an allotment, you know, you can easily grow herbs on a, a kitchen window or, you know, in a box if you've got a balcony or something like that, or even if you've just got a patio, you know, um, a small planter that you can um, get hold of or just a, just a reasonable sized pot, you can soon grow. And most herbs are very pretty plants, to be honest with you. Um, you know, you can... Uh, you know you can get very orna you know sort of quite ornamental looking herbs and um, so the you know they're nice to look at but also at the same time you know they're a, a functional edible plant that you can keep taking little sprigs off as and when you you make anything that requires herbs in the kitchen but uh, so I'm just putting two seeds in each of these as I'm as I'm talking to you um, and what I will tend to do is um, pull out the weaker one of the two so that's why I'm getting the seeds, that's why I'm planting the seeds around um, sort of an inch or half an inch to an inch apart so that when I pull out the weaker one it doesn't disturb the roots of the of the uh, the stronger one so you know even though I'm planting two in each one what I could possibly do is if I've got two that plants that are reasonably strong anyway what I could potentially do is separate them later but um, obviously that's not ideal to do so basically I've got two seeds pretty much in each one now. Uh, I seem to have one missing in there. No, there's one there. Um, and again with, with um, tomato seeds, you know, they are a reasonably small seed. Uh, what you want to be doing is just putting a little sprinkle of um, vermiculite or um, compost. It actually advises on this packet of seed to um, um, just to put a little bit of compost on. All the Mickey light, but um, right, I'm quite sparing with the seeds because what I'm going to be doing, to be honest with you, is I'm, I'm going to do two batches of um, tomatoes. Um, so I'm, there's uh, what's that? Two, four, six, eight. Hang on, four, eight, sixteen, uh, twenty, four, twenty-eight. So I've almost got 60 plants there, so that may well do me actually, but uh, what I'm going to do is do them in two batches. The other um, tomatoes I'm going to be growing this year, which I'm going to put in slightly later, is um, the uh, the cherry the cherry type tomatoes. Now I'm not quite sure, I can't remember the name now, because these are some that I grew last year and I've saved the seed. Um, but they're quite nice, um, they grow about kind of five foot high, and they're very heavy croppers. Uh, with, with with money maker, I mean there are quite a few really good varieties of um, tomatoes out there, but uh, money maker is one that I've always found is uh, you know a surefire bet. You know you never, I've, I've never really had a problem with um, tomatoes. I had a little bit of blight last year, but I can't blame the the plants for that. That was just uh, something that happened. So again, I've not really pressed the ground um, down on on these. You know this this compost is is nice and. Um, you know, nice and loose. What I want to um, do really is make sure that the uh, make sure that the that the seeds stay moist, um, but at the same time, I don't want to um, you know sort of put them into any um, sort of firm soil because I want the roots to be able to grow down easily, so they can get themselves established. Now, this this compost, as I say, is really ideal for seeds. Um, and it's by a company called um, Clover and I've, I have used this before and it is really good stuff however it hasn't really got any sort of long lasting fertiliser in it so it's ideal for seeds um, again obviously put your name tags in um, it's, so it is really good for seed however you know if you're if you're doing um, or at least this type if you're doing long term um, sort of potting you know if you're potting up a plant or something like that you're much better off um, are they using this with some additional fertiliser so you need to kind of augment the amount of uh, fertiliser in there or um, you know you need to uh, 
you need to use a, a, a different one. Miracle Grow is the one that I typically use. Um, with a lot of the seeds I use, as I say, I use John Innings number one. Um, all the all the specific seed compost that they um, that they do. Um, always make sure when you're first watering them that sometimes what you can get is a seed popping up where the because uh, you put such a light sprinkling of compost on there, sometimes it can um, come up to the top. But uh, now, as soon as I've done these, um, these are going to stay in the greenhouse at least today. What I might do is put these in the house just to help them along with the germination. Um, as I say, I am with the tomatoes. I'm taking a bit of a risk, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I don't normally put tomatoes in this early, but what I'm trying to do is give them a, um, an early start. But you know, I mean, as it's really still only the start of March, um, we can um, quite easily um, get frost, and I can almost guarantee that we are going to get some frost in the uh, in the coming weeks. So, obviously, you know, if you are putting seedlings in now. You know, you need to make sure if you haven't got a heated greenhouse, you most certainly need to make sure that, you know, whatever you're putting in now, you're able to sort of move, you know, you know if we are going to have a, um, a frost, that you can move it into the house and out of the way. Obviously, the further south you go, you're less likely to have frost. So obviously, you know, if you're living in the London area, um, you know, you're less likely to have a, a staff of frost. But Anywhere sort of, um, we're about 100 miles or so north of um, London and we're quite likely to have frost for the next couple of months um, here and there. But uh, so, that's the, so that's the herbs and the tomatoes at least I'm going to put in now. There are a few more herbs I'm going to put in, but um, there are a few other things I want to put in today. Um, I'm going to be putting in the, uh, the broccoli, um, which uh, really you can sow from February, so this is quite a hardy plant, so I don't really need to worry about that. What I'll be doing with this is casting it onto a, um, a tray, I'll show you in a moment, just very quickly. Um, the one thing that I was late with last year, the, the alpine strawberries, I'm going to give them another go. And uh, I'm also going to be putting the, the kale, um, that I said I was going to grow, and um, also the um, I'm just going to put some salad leaves in and some um, some lettuce as well to get us going. Just a few of these just to get us going in the, uh, the spring. So uh, that's what I'll be doing next. Okay, so um, what I'm going to be doing now is the broccoli. Now, last year I had a... Um, I didn't have a good year for broccoli last year. It, it, it just wasn't, um, wasn't very good at all. So what I've done this year is um, I've actually brought some Calabris F1 Green Magic um, seeds which um, hopefully will be uh, better quality. Now I'm going to grow this slightly differently basically I've just got a bog standard um, um, garden um, um, seed tray and what I've done is basically split it in half, I've just put a couple of lollipop sticks up the middle to be honest with you and uh, what are we going to, going to be doing is planting the uh, the broccoli in one end now you only get you only get um, 60 seeds in here so a lot's going in and, and obviously all brassicas, all of the seed looks like kind of mustard seed. So, you know, it's all sort of kind of that big. And basically all I'm going to do is make sure that the reasonably, you know, what you don't want to do is make um, have sort of clump clumps of seed together, which is exactly what I'm getting at the moment. You know, it's, it's, it's well worth you spending a little time just getting them spread out, um, you know, so they're not too close. Because when you come to prick them out, which is how I do it, um, in fact, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to just plant them in the whole tray. Um, you know, what you can can get is it's quite difficult if you've got three seeds. I mean, with with, with brassicas, I always find you get a really good germination rate, and um, you know. Pretty much every one of these seeds is going to go, so um, you know don't uh, with you know with some plants you know when you've got a fifty percent success rate, you know you always typically plant a couple of seeds together, um, you know in the hope that one of the two will go. With with brassicas it's almost a you know surefire bet that everyone's going to go to be honest with you, or at least that's what I've found. So the one tip I can give you with brassicas is when you're putting the seeds in, even though they're quite fiddly and small, it's well worth you spending your time. Um, putting them kind of an inch or so apart, if, if not more. Um, otherwise, when you come to prick them out, it can be uh, a little bit 
little bit tricky and what you can do is damage the roots and you don't really want to be damaging the roots so uh, you know try and get them as evenly spread out as you possibly can do in years gone by I've just kind of cast them onto the top and um, I've kind of struggled to um, prick them out a bit to be honest with you and um, you know I've kind of learnt my lesson and uh, now I sort of take a little bit more time to sort of put them in a bit more evenly spread so when it comes to pricking them out you know I haven't got so when you pull each plant out you know you get like a little clump of clump of earth on or potting coppers on each one so there's a couple of couple of ones left and basically all I'm going to do with this is um, with all brassicas all I do is basically just sprinkle sprinkle some uh, dirt across now I'm you know I'm, I'm, I'm probably pouring about um, it, it probably seems more but uh, I'm only really putting around five millimeters or so of um, um, soil on the top you know you don't uh, you don't need to um, be too sort of fine uh, with these and, and what I am going to do is as you know brassicas like um, firm soil so before you plant these into the ground what you most certainly want to do is sort of dig the ground over and then you want to walk all over the ground to um, to sort of uh, you know, to firm the ground down. Now, unlike the other seeds, what I'm doing now is I'm actually firming it down with my hands. You know, you're not too much pressure. You know, you're not. You know, you know, you're not trying to sort of, you know, sort of squeeze them in. But basically, what you want, what you want is the ground to be sort of reasonably firm around them, because brassicas tend to like that. Now, what I'm going to do is obviously give this a little bit of water with this with the sprayer. Then all I'm going to do is put a piece of glass um, over the. Uh, oh. I'm going to put a piece of um, glass over the top of this. Now, um, you know, that piece of glass can really want like a little bit of a vent in there or something like that. So, because these are going to stay in the, most certainly stay in the greenhouse, what I'm going to do is um, just at one end of the glass put some, uh, I don't know, either a pencil or a lollipop stick or something so you have got a bit of ventilation in there. Because what you don't want to do is sort of uh, just in case you don't come to the allotment for a day, uh, what you don't want to do is the seeds to cook because um, it can get really hot in there. So you know these need a reasonable amount of water. You know you want to, you know you want to make sure they've got plenty of water. These um, that's probably about enough. Um, now, as I say, I'm going to put the piece of glass on there. And what I'll probably do is just at one end put a couple of. I don't know if you can see that. What I've done is put a couple of lollipop sticks across the corner, and that'll give a bit of ventilation um, for the uh, the glass, or put a pencil across or something like that, and that'll allow the airflow. But uh, most certainly, in days like today where it's nice and warm, it, it might be an idea to actually take the glass off and just um, you know you know so they don't get too hot. But the um, the the kale is exactly the same um, exactly the same way as um, these. The, the seed looks. Literally identical. All all brassicas look the same. So there are the seeds there. Look. So um, don't. Um, I'm not going to show you putting these in because it's exactly the same method as this. So the broccoli, cauliflower, um, cabbage, um, kale, um, all are done in exactly the same way as this. Um, you know, sort of put them out. Then you can prick them out and put them into your separate pots. And as soon as they're big enough, what I do is um, I put them into these um, these trays here. So what I'll do is I'll prick them out and uh, I'll put them into these cells, I'll put one in each, and then they'll stay in there until they're ready to go out. Now I bought these from uh, Wilco's last year, and I think um, five of these, five of these bits were um, were about uh, about a pound, I think. And uh, you know you can use them, you know, for you know you know sort of quite a few years. And the thing I like about these is you can you can uh, you can push your finger in at the bottom. And actually push the plant out rather, you know, you know, to rather than sort of disturb or touch the roots, you can actually get them out. So, so they'll be in here probably till they're about, um, I don't know, about an inch, two inches high, and then they'll be pricked out into into here, and then they'll stay in here for probably about three or four weeks, and then they'll be in the ground. So uh, that's that's uh, that's lovely come up in the uh, the next uh, couple of months. But uh, so all I'm going to do now is put a piece of glass over that, and that's done. Um, kale, cabbage, anything else is all the same. Really, um, purple sprouting broccoli, it's too early for that yet. Uh, but you can get your kale in now and you can get your, uh, your cabbages and stuff like that in now. As I say, we're still a little bit early for seeds, 
but uh, brassicas tend to be a little bit more hardy towards the frost than, uh, or, or, or at least the cold than uh, most plants so you can potentially put them in there. So thank you for watching this episode of Jim's Allotment Garden. I hope it's been of some use to you um, and you've picked up some tips. Please do put any comments or questions that you've got below and I'll always get back to you. Um, coming up there's going to be all sorts of um, bits and bobs. There's, you know, there's another 12 Mother Nature to try and get through in the next few weeks. Um, and I'm going to be building um, quite a few things with pallets. Um, there's going to be a, a compost. I'm going to grow some, um, sorry, build some um, surfaces for the greenhouse in here. Um, so I can be, you know, putting all the pots. Obviously, the primary use for the greenhouse this time of year is to, um, you know, is to grow your little plants up, uh, you, you know, your vegetables and that for the uh, for the garden. So I'm, I'm going to be building some surfaces along here. So there's going to be some more practical things coming on, and also there'll be still um, sort of digging and all sorts of stuff as and when I can get on the uh, the allotment. As you can probably hear, it's absolutely chucking it down at the moment. So uh, and I'll be potting up cuttings and all this kind of business. So there's going to be a few more seeds going in. But uh, we're still reasonably early for seeds. You know, I'm still concerned that we're going to get a frost and stuff. So, um, you know, the majority of the seeds are going to be going in in April, really. Um, it's sort of now that we need to start thinking about um, chitting early potatoes. But your main crop potatoes don't need to go in for another or start to be chitted for at least another sort of two weeks or so. Really, you need to be aiming to put those in um, early. You need to be sort of putting them in um, sort of really um, sort of early... So late late April, early May, and your and your main crop needs to be going in sort of mid mid May or something like that. So um, don't be don't be too keen to get your potatoes going because you know we can still have frosts in May, and uh, I'd hate for people to lose their potatoes. But anyway, thank you very much for uh, watching Jim Vlog, as I say, and I'll be uh, I'll be back with you very soon. Thank you. Bye bye now.